The U.S. is a very large country and its population is very une unevenly distributed. So we need to transport a lot of people and stuff across very long distances. We have a sprawling transportation system in the United States. It's been built over the last 50 years, and that's really our starting point for trying to find ways to move transportation to a place that uses less energy, more efficiently, less emissions. Transportation is essential to the American lifestyle. We've set up our country in a way that requires us to go to and from many, many miles, often on a daily basis. We are a society on the move here. We are the most mobile society at any place on the planet. And right now it takes fossil fuels to do that. Currently, we use about 13 million barrels of oil a day for transportation purposes. About 60% of that is in automobiles. So if we can find a way to save energy that we use in transportation, we can have a huge impact on the total amount of energy that we consume. We're talking about a layered, very complex weave of vehicles and technologies. First, there's the private car. We, of course, rely on the private car to get to work, to get to school, and get, to get around. We have fleet vehicles. There's the post office. They have a fleet of small light trucks in most cases, right up to heavy truckers with these gigantic 18-wheelers that are moving the commerce across the country. Then we have other forms of mass transportation in cities and elsewhere, buses and, and, and that kind of thing that are moving larger numbers of people. All of these systems essentially use liquid transportation fuels, read petroleum. Uh, whether it's jet fuel or gasoline or diesel fuel. You know, this is an instance of where certain investments and policy choices that were made many, many, many years ago have led us down a path that is very much an American path. Really what we're, we're left with is thinking about, well, how do we sort of re-steer the course? And there may be ways out there where we can do that. First of all, our internal combustion engine cars are getting greater and greater fuel efficiency. Currently, the average automobile operates between 15 and 30 percent efficient, meaning that the total BTUs or, or energy content of the fuel you put into the vehicle, only about uh, a sixth of that actually goes into moving the person. We've had dramatic movement on that in this country with CAFE standards. CAFE standards were standards that were imposed in the mid-1970s, 1975 to be exact, in response to the fuel crises that we had during that particular time. What they were all about was requiring automobile manufacturers to begin to achieve, over time, higher and higher fuel efficiency levels. Just in the last several years, the federal government, along with auto manufacturers, agreed to increase the fuel efficiency. And so basically, we'll be going from 35 miles per gallon uh, today as the standard, uh, up to you know estimates of about 50 miles per gallon. The promise of those standards are far beyond where we thought we could go five years ago, and our auto manufacturers seem comfortable they can meet them. There's a lot of heavy lifting here because we have millions and millions of vehicles on the road, passenger vehicles, trucks, buses, you name it. And we are very invested in the old technology internal combustion engine. We're wringing some important advances out of that, making them much more efficient, much cleaner, but ultimately to move through the transition and get to the place where we're in a completely sustainable environment, we're going to need a different technology set all together. Now we're talking more about compressed natural gas in the private vehicle fleet or liquefied natural gas in the heavy trucking, heavy vehicle fleet. 
Compressed natural gas has a lot of advantages. Uh, it's a cleaner burning fuel. It actually has a higher octane rating than gasoline. The price differential between a natural gas driven mile and a gasoline or a diesel driven mile is very, is, is very compelling right now. The main problem is infrastructure and potentially a chicken and the egg problem. Uh, we would have to have new kinds of, uh, uh, of fueling stations uh, and are people going to build the fueling stations uh, when there are no cars and people are going to buy the cars if there are no fueling stations. CNG vehicles have for a long time been used in fleets. It's where they can get leverage on a few highly utilized fueling stations. And that makes perfect sense for taxis, buses, and short-term delivery trucks, which knows that you know, ahead of time where it's gonna be almost every minute of the day and can refill as needed at a fixed spot. So gas can have an impact on, on transportation through direct use and compressed natural gas, but probably more important will be the fuel that generates electricity that we use in cars. There are two major types of electric vehicles on the market today. One is a pure electric vehicle, which runs off of batteries. Uh, you plug it in at home, it, and it stores energy in the battery, and then you use that energy to fill the vehicle. The other type that uses electricity is a hybrid vehicle that has an internal combustion engine combined with an electrical source of power. So that internal combustion engine helps charge uh, the electrical portion of the car and so it switches back and forth. So if you're going down a highway, you're going to be running off of gasoline, whereas if you take that car into town, it's going to automatically switch over to an electric source of energy. It's a very efficient way uh, to reduce fuel consumption because uh, the electric motor is, is a very efficient way to deliver energy. It's about 60% of the energy that's generated by an electric vehicle actually gets transferred to propel the vehicle. That's very different compared to a gasoline engine, which only operates closer to 20% efficient. And if we look at the operating costs, actually electricity is not that much cheaper than gasoline today. But when we incorporate that efficiency, you can operate an electric vehicle on the order of about a quarter of the cost of a conventional vehicle but there are other things that are relevant to drivers that matter. So for example, driving range, you know, the size and comfort of the vehicle. So these are all, all sorts of things when you sort of take a more holistic view of what you mean by efficiency and get beyond just looking at energy efficiency per se, that uh, electric automobiles are more problematic. When you think about batteries, uh, you have to worry about when did this battery run out because every time I recharge it, the capacity might be diminished slightly. When will I have to replace the battery because I'm actually going through that process? All the components that go into the battery, we think about disposal, but the components into it like lithium, for example, and other rare earth metals. I mean, these things are things that we have to worry about at some point as well. Really what you're getting at are technological hurdles. And this is where R&D can play a really critical role because if we can figure out a way to make a battery that can hold a charge longer, that can be recharged more so it has a longer life, we eliminate to a certain extent some of the concerns that might be there right now. We know that today's available uh, plug-in electric vehicle technology is ready to serve the majority of transportation needs for the average consumer and even a wide variety of needs for commercial fleets. However, to envision a fully renewable electric transportation uh, vision will take many decades, potentially um, upwards of, of 40 or 50 years. The United States has a transportation system which is almost totally based on cars and, and roads. And all legislators, all city councils, all states and the federal government know only how to expand that system. And so we need to step out of it, and generally, as a society. We need to start considering other alternatives. The Rocky Mountain Institute, we are huge fans of folks moving some way other than by themselves in a car. The good news is, is for every situation where there's more than a very few 
people that need to go from A to B. There is an optimum that involves something other than an individual and a car. If you replace some of your cars with a functioning, on-demand, highly reliable public transportation system, then we will get rid of many of the problems that we have today. Interestingly, in this country, there's been a huge renaissance of light rail systems. Why is that? Because it's the best way to move a lot of people from a fairly prescribed set of A's to B. It is the most efficient, it does move the most people, and it can have compelling economics. Metro systems in cities are bloodlines, lifelines, for a city to thrive. If you look at New York and you look at Paris, you look at Warsaw, where the metro line is not far from, you have the most expensive properties, you have the highest concentration of businesses, and you have most life in a city. What else works well? Bus systems work well. Bus systems that actually offer creature comforts and benefits to their riders. The innovation that's been around for a while, but it's still an innovation, is called bus rapid transport, where the bus operates more like a train. The bus comes up and it's almost like you're getting on the subway car and you step straight off a platform and boom, and then off you go and you're not sitting there while the driver's counting out change. The whole system works smoothly just like uh, subway would. Those are coming. They're, they're in place in certain routes in Los Angeles. Now they all have Wi-Fi and all of us want to play with our smartphones instead of driving and cussing at traffic. But also there are a, a number of different um, private owned networks of cars that uh, you can get a car just for the day or just for a couple hours. Again, that option didn't really used to exist and I think we're just now trying to figure out how to adjust to those uh, different options. The hardest thing to address is the amount of revolutions of our tires it requires for us to conduct our daily lives. And that requires infrastructural investment, investing in transit, but also investing in where do you build the homes. Do you build in the exurbs or do you build back in filling uh, the cities? Because the way we are set up, you have to drive two miles to the Walmart, you have to go to Walmart to get your groceries for your family, and you don't really have an option. You also got to work on things like whether people could maybe do their job by not going to work every day. So telecommuting or having some flexible work hours. And maybe there's ways that you can arrange the land uses in such a way that uh, people can walk to work or bike to work or it's more likely that they would take transit. Almost all of us carry a cell phone now that is not only a telephone for us, but it's a way we receive email, it's a way we access the web. It can be a way for us to participate in conference calls. If you think about it, you're using your cell phone or your tablet for that, in many instances, actually replaces a trip. And that sort of planning and, and looking at how can we build how we live our daily lives in a way that doesn't require as much energy to move around is probably the, the, the hardest to tackle and the most important to tackle because we could make our cars more efficient, our fuels better for the environment, but if we keep developing our country like we are, the amount we have to drive to live our daily lives will swamp the other two factors. We are essentially wasting time in the United States by building the only thing we know, which is more and more lanes on the already overcrowded freeways, with no foresight, no perspective, that it leads us precisely nowhere. The fact of the matter is, we're going to have to find a better way to deal with our transportation problems. I think we need to reconceive of what transportation truly is. There is no one silver bullet out there. It's going to be a lot of different solutions. <laughs>